Hi everyone, today's video is of Mia, this German Shepherd in pastels. The just over two and a half hour version of this is available on my Patreon channel where I go through everything step by step if you are wanting to draw various breeds, that's mainly what my Patreon channel focuses on. I have some fur focus tutorials, a nose tutorials, so everything over there for whether or not you're a complete beginner or looking to perfect any of your art techniques and potentially want to do this as a career. So like with most of my portraits, you'll see that I start off by working on the eyes. Now, the reason for that is that is the soul of the portrait and it is what's going to make that dog that dog. Each eye has to be accurate and I spend a lot of time, even when I am working on a smaller scale like this, to make sure that I get everything as accurate as I can. Now, because the reference photo of this German Shepherd was taken outside, there was a beautiful reflection in her eyes. So you want to make sure you capture that. That is what's going to make that eye look realistic, your lights and your darks more than your colour. You can see that I've got the redder tones in the eye, but the thing that makes that eye look more realistic is that nice punchy highlight on top. Now when I am applying my base layers, most of the time I like to use a soft pastel that I've sanded down on a bit of sandpaper and apply that to my paper with a soft tool. In this situation, because Mia has quite a lot of chest in this portrait, it's made, obviously because I've then got to scale everything down to make her fit onto this A4 size portrait, which is approximately 8 by 12 everything else is going to be that much smaller. So I've opted to use my pencils for this base layer. So everything on this portrait is purely done with pastel pencils, apart from some pinks, which you'll see me work with the tongue and the inside of her ears. Now, I do think your base layers are important. They do need to be accurate. You need to be putting your lights and your darks in the main places. That's all I'm focusing on at this point. No kind of detail. You just want to be putting a good foundation down so that it's better to then have something to put your details on top so that you can then add more realism with each layer that you add. If you start adding too much detail too soon and your base layers are not how you want them, your detail is not going to lay over those, lace, those base layers as easy as if you were to get your base foundation as accurate as you possibly can. So it's something that I spend a lot of time in refining because I think in the long run it actually makes the process quicker and you certainly do get better results. The problem with rushing your base layers, you then don't actually have the right foundation to put your details on top and the result will not be the same. Now, what you can then end up doing is blending out all of that detail that you've put on and going back and having to make your layers more refined and usually darker because quite often the, the base layers are not dark enough and your detailed layers do not show up on top. So if that's something that you're struggling with and your pastel pencils are not laying over the top of your base layers as you would like and being as punchy as you'd like, it's usually because your base layers are too light, then you need to go a bit darker. Now I speak about it a lot in my not just my YouTube videos, but in my Patreon videos. Colour is something that everyone fixates on and it can often hold you back thinking, I don't know the right colour to use, if only there was the right pencil to use. And really, if only there was that one pencil that was the perfect colour, our job would be made so much easier, but it just doesn't exist. You have to layer and use your pencils or your soft pastel sticks, whatever it is, your pan pastels, all together to create the colour that you're after. It's very rare that you're going to find a colour that is exactly what you're looking for. Now the good thing with pastels, they are very much like acrylics in that they can blend really really nicely. It is like mixing on a palette. If you use your soft tools like with pan pastels, they are designed to mix those colours together and create something more what you're looking for. Because as I say, you're not going to find the colour that is exactly what you're wanting. So that being said, without fixating on colour too much, it's more about making sure you get your lights and your darks accurate. They have to be in the right place and they have to be going in the right direction. So no highlight or shadow is random, it's there for a reason. Most of the time it is because the structural and skeletal system of that subject that you're drawing, regardless if it's a dog, cat, horse, a person, anything, they have that unique bone and muscular structure which makes that dog that dog. So you need to be drawing those lights and darks in the right places because they are falling in a specific place because there is that bony hard structure underneath which is making the fur flow and travel in that direction for a specific reason. 
on this section of the ear and also as I mentioned on the tongue I am going to be using pink soft pastel sticks now the reason for that is I use various brands I've got the Derwent the Pit Pastel, the Carbofello and the Caran d'Ache and they don't really have nice lighter shades of pink so what I've done is I put a layer down of just a, a lighter you know an off-white colour and then I've put a pink soft pastel on top and blended that out just to give me that subtle pink shade that I am after so you, you might have them in the sets that if you're using all of the colours but because I only select the light fast colours I am a little bit more limited on the pencils that I can use purely because I only select the ones that are light fast. Now as you can see from the videos here on YouTube I layer a lot and I think that's the key to getting as much detail and realism as you can. The paper that I use for this is pastel matte and by far it's been the one that I found to be the most forgiving in that you can layer endlessly and if you make a mistake you can just cover it over with with a previous layer that you've already done you know a similar type of color and just cover it over and then go back over it you will also notice that i've got a background in there and it's just a light beige tan background so but i always make sure i put my backgrounds in first most of the time 99 percent of the time that is because I want to make sure that I overlap any fur onto the background. So that is why I'm doing it this way. I know other people sometimes do it in the reverse. But for me, I don't like my subjects to just look like they're stickers stuck on top of the background. So I want it to be part of it, even if it is something like a simple background like this. So I always choose to put my background in first overlap that background slightly onto my initial sketch line so that I don't end up with that glow effect around the subject and the background and then that means that I can then overlap my fur onto the background so that everything comes together and it looks more natural and for this background I just use my soft pastel sticks and the Rembrandt are the ones that I use for that. When you are doing portraits such as this where we are working from a reference photo if you have a breed such as this where they have specific markings in specific places, it's really important to make sure that your initial sketch is accurate. For instance, these lighter yellow or orangey patches above her eyes, you don't they shouldn't be in the wrong place, even if it is just by a, let's say half a centimetre or something, because that is going to change the structure of that dog and it will look different at the end when everything else comes together. So you need to make sure that your initial outline is correct. Now what I do is I sketch everything out on a separate piece of paper because pastel matte does not like to be erased. It can leave marks on that. So, And as we know, it's an expensive paper. So my preferred option is to sketch my outline on a separate piece of paper. I then use transfer paper between that initial sketch and the pastel mat and then with a embossing tool, I then transfer my image via the transfer paper onto the pastel mat. This ensures that there are no lines, you're not having to you know, erase areas on the pastel mat that's going to potentially then mark that paper. It keeps everything clean and tidy and you already know that your initial sketch that you've already done is accurate before going ahead and doing it straight on your pastel mat paper. But when you are working on something like this, I do always make sure that I sketch in where these important markings are such as these lighter patches above her eyes to make sure that I get everything in the right place. One of the most common questions that I'm asked is why won't my pencil layers go over the top of my base layers? Now usually most of the time this is because the tooth of the paper has been filled and you can't therefore have you know you can't then overlap your layers on top of that so you really only got one option when you get to that point. You can try and use a softer pencil such as the Caran d'Ache. They can sometimes overlap, but again, you can't really get nice sharp details with those because they are a softer lead, so you can't get as much of a, a you know a sharper point. So because I don't like throwing artwork away, and I think you learn from every portrait that you do, I personally would be applying a workable fixative so that you can then apply some layers on top. Now, I don't use fixatives on my work at all, but if I did come across that issue where I was not able to put my detailed layers on top, I would therefore go ahead and use a workable fixative. I personally don't use workable, fi well, a fixative at the end of a portrait because it can shift the colour and the tone. 
and we've put so many hours into these portraits that it's really disheartening when the fixative does change the colour of your portrait. Now I did try them when I first started with pastels and the first piece that I used the fixative on I actually had to throw away because it completely ruined it. The I thought that might be just more of my error because I haven't used a fixative before. So I did another portrait and I applied the fixative again, being extra cautious with it. And it did not ruin it to the point where I threw it away, but I didn't sell it and I've just put it in the drawer. And it's something that I've never looked at again because I'm not happy with it. It completely shifted everything and it almost made the finer details dissolve and it's nowhere near how it looked prior to me applying the fixative so it's something that I don't do and I will never do unless they bring out something where it doesn't make the colour shift at all which in how fixative work and how they bind the the pigment and, and the pastel together it's not going to happen there is going to be a colour shift so for me I mount all my pieces myself or I get my framer to do it and then I just say to my clients about putting them behind glass. Once they're behind glass with the mat, they're absolutely fine and they're not going to get damaged. When you are working on areas like this on the bridge of the nose, the fur here is much shorter than the fur on the top of the face. So you're not going to be trying to put in each individual fur strokes as such. It's more just getting where your differences in your midtones, your shadows and your highlights just to indicate at that fur. If you try and put fur in on areas such as this that are you know, more detailed than the reference photo calls for, you're going to make this part of the body, or in this case the, the nose here, you're going to make the fur look longer than what it actually is. Now, I will just mention, because I was very engrossed in this portrait at the time, I didn't realise how much of the sun was coming through the blackout blind. I thought, because I had the blinds down, that it wouldn't have, have made the white balance of my camera and the brightness just so much. So I do apologise for that. But that's what's caused that. Obviously a very sunny day when I did this portrait. So you will see, especially on the bridge of the nose here, there is not much colour at all. It's mainly greys and blacks. However, I'm still creating this realism because I'm getting my lights and my darks accurate and in the right place. So that's the main thing to focus on. Colour is something that I get messaged about all the time. And I do certainly feel that if you are struggling with identifying which colour you should be using to use an eyedropper tool. I do have a video here and I'll put a link to it in the corner here, um, which I'll also put a link in the description. But it can really help to isolate a colour in that area that you're trying to, you know, you're trying to pinpoint. You're trying to get that as close to the reference photo as you can. But... You know, put more focus on your contrast, your lights and your darks, because that is what's going to make your portrait that much more realistic. You can have a portrait that is spot on in colour and it's exactly like the reference photo. But if you do not have your contrast there and your darks dark enough and your lights light enough, your portrait is going to be flat. A portrait or any artwork that you look at that has got no contrast but the colour is spot on is not going to be as noticed and as eye-catching as compared to a portrait where the contrast is you know, correct, you've got your lights light enough and your darks dark enough, but the colour might be slightly not as accurate. Because the person who's looking at that artwork does not know what that reference photo is so they're not going to know the color but they're not they are definitely going to know the contrast they're going to look at that bit of artwork and go well it's nice but the contrast needs to be hyped up in order to make that that much more better so try not to focus on the color as much as the contrast because that is what's going to make your artwork that much more realistic Something that I talk a lot about in my Patreon videos is how to hold the pencils and how much pressure to put on those pencils because depending on the angle of your hand and how much pressure on your pencil and where on the barrel of the pencil you are holding it, you're going to create different fur strokes. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the just over two and a half hour version of this is available over there and I will, during each of those Patreon tutorials, if I'm getting a different fur stroke, I will explain how I'm holding that pencil to achieve that. So because most of the, well, all of those areas where I'm explaining that are in real time, you can see exactly how I'm holding the pencils to create those fur strokes. But there are a couple of things to bear in mind that the more pressure that you put on that pencil, just like if you were using a paintbrush, the thicker those lines will be. The finer the detail, the lighter the pressure. Especially this is something where you're, you, you know, if you're doing whiskers, 
the harder you press because you think you want them to appear much more whiter and brighter you're gonna get a much more thicker line which is not often how we want whiskers are quite fine so as i mentioned i don't like applying the soft pastel sticks directly to the paper but in this case because the pastel pencils do lack these nice shades of pinks i am in this case applying the soft pastel sticks directly to the paper if you do go ahead and you use this technique in your own work, just make sure that you don't apply too much pressure to those soft pastel sticks because you will feel the tooth of the paper and it will make it difficult for your pastel detail layers to go on top. One of my planned focus videos for Patreon is going to be a mouth where you can clearly see the gums, the teeth and the tongue because I know it's an area that can be quite challenging. But the main thing to focus on, like with this kind of pose where you can just mainly see the tongue, it's more about catching, as I've said before, your lights and your darks. The tongue is going to overlap and sit on the canine teeth underneath and create indents and ridges that may not make sense. If you are struggling to draw any part of your portrait and it doesn't make sense to you, turn your artwork and your reference photo upside down because that will force your brain to just see the abstract shapes rather than the, you know, the fact that oh, I'm drawing a tongue, I know what a tongue looks like. So turn it all upside down and you'll be able to better judge where your lights and your darks need to be, the shape of that that you're drawing and it will just make it that much easier. So I hope this video was of use. Don't forget to give it a like. It really does help if it was useful. And if you want to see future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button to get notified of future videos. And if Patreon is of use, there'll be a link below in the description. Thank you for watching. Bye.